O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We're grateful, God, for another day. Thank you, God, for keeping us. Thank you, Lord, for this first day of 2023. It is a new year on our calendar, but it is a day, God, that has been on your heart and mind since before the foundation of this world. And we thank you that you have provided for us and made it possible, God, that we're able to see this day. Thank you, God, for calling us unto yourself that we might worship together in spirit and in truth. Thank you for Word for Life Church Ministries, for all of our members and partners and friends. Thank you, God, that we're able to join together in this way on this day to celebrate our risen Lord Jesus the Christ, to praise you, God, to worship you with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul. We thank you, God, that we are blessed beyond measure, that your grace is sufficient, that your mercy is new yet even this morning. Great, O oh God, is your faithfulness unto us. And even more, God, great is your faithfulness unto your very word. And we thank you, God, that you've given us your word. We thank you, God, that your word came to heal us and cleanse us. And God, that Jesus the Christ has set us free. We're grateful for salvation today. We thank you, God, for the liberty that we have in him, the hope that we have in him, the joy that we find, even the restoration that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank you, God, that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Even, God, we're surrounded by brothers and sisters in fellowship here in this platform on this day to give you glory, honor, and praise. We're here, God, lifting each other up, holding each other up, bearing one another's burdens, uh, celebrating one another, rejoicing with one another, even, Lord, mourning with one another. And we do so, God, because you've given us the strength to make it, the strength to stand, the strength, oh God, to be who you have called us to be. And all the more, God, you've given to us your love. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Lord, thank you for showing us how to love, even, Lord, as we love one another and, Lord, love ourselves. We thank you, God, for the privilege that we have to be alive today. And what a joy it is. You've carried us all throughout 2022. And we stand here at the dawn of 2023 with great expectation and yes, even anticipation for what you are going to do through us, through your church, through Word for Life Church Ministries. I pray God, a special blessing on all those who've come to be with us in worship today. Those Lord who are participating with us, those who just wanted to come see my prayer, oh God, is that you will begin even now the process of transforming us, Lord, into what you would have us to be, Lord, that we might have a sense, Lord, of belonging, a sense, God, of victory, Lord, a sense of joy, a sense of hopefulness. Lord, let it be said that as we've come together in this worship experience today, that we've given glory and honor to your name. We worship you, God, and we do it together, and we lift high our voice to say yet again, thank you. Your name, God, is to be praised. And it is unto Jesus, our Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we pray, and in his name we ask it all. And to you we say, amen. Amen, church. Let's worship God together. Happy New Year. God, we just celebrate you in this place. From year to year, you remain the same. Nothing has changed about your goodness, your grace, your mercy. You are the everlasting God, our everlasting Father. And we celebrate you, oh God.
morning again. I am Laren Robertson, pastor of Word for Life Church Ministries, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to worship with us. We're located in Fort Washington, Maryland, just outside the nation's capital. And what a joy it is on this first Sunday of the year to know that you are with us in worship. I pray that you've uh, enjoyed the experience thus far. And if you haven't done so already, I want to invite you to drop a comment into the comment section or in the chat box. If you're watching us on Facebook, YouTube, or on Zoom, certainly invite your participation as we fellowship together. Even now, let's wave across the virtual aisle. You see some names or comments come in. Uh, do me a favor, do us all a favor, and just let us know you're with us. Our, our aim is just to make sure that we exchange greetings with you. We certainly know that you could have chosen any other forum to worship uh, today, and we certainly bless God that you decided to be with us here at Word for Life Church Ministries. I won't take much of your time today, but I do uh, believe there's a word from the Lord. It is found in the book of Ecclesiastes, that Old Testament book of wisdom. Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter. I'm going to read the first six verses of that chapter, read from the New King James Version, and here's how it reads. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a servant to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. The clouds are full of rain. They empty themselves upon the earth. If a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Amen. God's word and God's will are blessed, so too then may we, God's people, find ourselves herein. For a brief moment today, I just want to talk to you from this idea, focus. As we embark on the new year, I want to talk today about focus. What has your attention? By the time of January 1st, and this day rolls around, many of us have already decided what our plans are going to be for this new year. We have prayed, we've strategized with partners, we've crafted vision boards, We've met with mentors and mentees. We've read all the books. We've listened to all the podcasts. We've watched all the videos and all of the reels. And now it's time for us to launch out into the deep. 2023 has great promise for us. And we ought to, we ought to make plans. We ought to do all of these things that I've just mentioned. Uh, even at the dawn of 2023, however, some of us have been caught off guard. <laughs> That's right, January 1st crept up on us and we haven't either made plans or finalized our plans, but still we ought to give it a shot because failure to plan is planning to fail. It is unfortunate, however. Sometimes even our best plans don't work out like we expect them to. To describe this phenomenon, the poet Robert Burns put it like this, but mouse, you are not alone in providing foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men often go askew and leave us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. And then in his American classic entitled Of Mice and Men, the author John Steinbeck picks up on the reality of spoiled plans. This book is a story about two men, George and Lenny. They set out to own a ranch and while they advance adventurously toward achieving that goal, the reader, who has been pulling for George and Lenny throughout the novel, is ultimately reminded that sometimes the unexpected happens and our best plans are laid to waste. Burns and Steinbeck do not intend to discourage people from making plans, oh no. Indeed, we know of their work because of the very need for planning. Instead, when prose and parable remind us that 
our plans can be quite fragile. Israel's King Solomon offers this word of wisdom to help us handle the unexpected nature of planning. Here's what Solomon has to say to us. Focus. Solomon is a good person to talk to about this. When he succeeded his father, David, on Israel's throne, he asked of God not riches or wealth or honor or the life of his enemies. He didn't even ask for long life for himself. But he asked God for wisdom and knowledge. And with the wisdom and knowledge God granted to him, this wise king reviews the landscape of life and arrives at a conclusion that may sound rather familiar to us. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It sounds like Solomon has given up, but in fact, the opposite is true. Solomon is sounding the alarm as it pertains to the aim of our intentions. He does not say, forget it. Instead, he says, focus. Come with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. There you will discover, just as experience has taught us, in the words of the Southern rap duo Outcast, nothing is for certain, nothing lasts forever. We can't be certain of this though, life is uncertain. And still we ought to plan and prepare for our expectations to eventually become our realities. So as we set sail into 2023, so that we do not advance aimlessly down the path of vanities and hopelessness that is common among mice and men. Solomon says, focus. What I appreciate about this simple word of wisdom is that Solomon also tells us what we should focus on. He says we should also know why focus is necessary. Whatever has our attention, whatever prompts uh, within us a determination for achievement, advancement, or attainment, wisdom demands our focus. And if that is too abstract an idea, hear what Jesus has to say about this. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 25, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing? Then he begins to draw this idea to a close in verse 34 of that same chapter. Verse 33, rather, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about things of its own. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Can I bottom line that for you? Jesus says, focus. As we enter into 2023, I just want to start this year off with Ecclesiastes chapter 11 to help us center our thoughts around this wisdom that comes to us from the scripture itself, that we might be inspired to pay attention to the things that matter. Or when it comes to the idea of focus, focus is necessary, first of all, because of that which is redeemable. Verses one through two of the text help us to see this. The first question is, on what should we focus? Since our plans and expectations are as diverse as our personalities, I dare not demand that your focus be on one particular matter. But this text suggests that our attention ought to be directed to that which is redeemable. And to say that something is redeemable is to suggest that it identifies with something that can be salvaged, something that can be saved. In other words, it can be brought back or returned by way of an exchange. Hear what Solomon has to say. Cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Solomon says, as we look out along the landscape of life and make whatever plans that we've desired to make, whatever God is moving on our heart to advance toward, 
Solomon says, make sure that whatever you do, your focus is on that which is redeemable. Solomon has in mind here the idea of an investment of sorts. No, he's not saying cast your physical bread that you eat upon waters. That would be of no effect. What Solomon is saying, however, is to take your resources and let them go where the water may go. If you know anything about water, water will always seek the path of least resistance. This is why we have leaks. This is why our gutter systems work the way they work. Water takes the path of least resistance and it goes where it can based on the barriers that do not exist. So what Solomon is saying here is that you can redeem that which you plan for if you have in mind the path of least resistance. If you put your resources out in the world, for instance, if your gifts for ministry, if your skills, your talents, perhaps those which were developed over the course of your professional career, Maybe it's a hobby that you have. Perhaps it's an intellectual ability or capacity to reason well. I'm not sure exactly what you are planning for or what you hope to achieve this year, but you ought to make sure that it is aiming at that which can be redeemed. In other words, don't let your talents, don't let your resources go to waste. Make sure that what you put out has a way of making its way somewhere else. That's the point of an investment. We don't make investments in the stock market in order to get no return. In fact, we make in investments in order to achieve a return. And though we may not know the market will go up, it will go down. There will be some high highs and there'll be some really kind of rather mundane plateaus. We don't know. The idea is, however, that if we keep our resources in hand, there is no way that when time comes, we'll find it later. We'll find it later. But the idea here is that you'll find more because it's something that's redeemable, something that can be brought back and made something more of. It's redeemable. But watch what also says, Simon says, uh, Solomon rather says about this notion of that which is redeemable. He says this, give those same resources to seven or maybe to eight because you don't know what trouble will be on the earth. Uh, Solomon is, is saying quite simply this, when it comes time for you to make that phone call, to solicit help, to ask persons to pray for you, to come alongside of you, if you have been diligent in ensuring that your gifts your resources, perhaps even you as an individual, have been present with other people, that you've been generous with your time, that you've been open and available for conversations. You just never know what kind of trouble might come on the earth where you are going to need help and rescue, where you might be in a position of one who needs to be redeemed. And so Solomon says, spread your resources wide to seven as a number to signify completion or perfection. And then he pushes it further and says, and also to eight, whomever we meet along the way, whether it be a stranger or a friend, an acquaintance or a loved one, Solomon says the wise thing to do as it pertains to focus is to spread wide your resources, ensure that what you are planning, that what you are aiming at, that what you hope to achieve is redeemable. Focus is necessary because it's something that should be redeemable. But also, Solomon says we should also focus on that which is inevitable. It's inevitable. Verses 3 through 4 of the text help us to see this. Solomon paints a picture of which we are all familiar. And in fact, just this last week, uh, the country was deluged with cold weather and winds. Rain fell in vast amounts. This is the picture that Solomon wants us to recall. Solomon says in verse 3, If the clouds are full of rain, the rain in those clouds are going to eventually fall. 
if a tree falls to the south or even perhaps to the north, wherever that tree falls, it's going to lay down right there. Then he says this, observe the wind. And if you keep your focus on the wind, you will not sow. You won't be busy because you're so busy looking at what the wind is doing. Solomon says, our focus is necessary because of things that are inevitable. There are certain things in life that are bound to happen from the day we are born until the day we draw our last breath. While we may not know with certainty the day nor the hour of these events that will come, be sure that certain things will happen. That's the portrait of the cloud gathering rain. When you can look up in that cloud, you see it gathering rain, perhaps the snow cloud, and you see it, perhaps your body can even feel it. When it gets enough rain, when the conditions are right, it will rain. And truly, the word of God is correct, that God, in fact, will rain on the just and the unjust. It's inevitable that God will pour blessings out on those that are righteous and those that we think are not righteous. It's the Lord's doing. It's inevitable. There are some matters in life that are bound to happen. If you keep on living, you're going to run into another birthday. If you keep on living, you're going to go to school and do well and graduate. If you keep on living, you're going to experience some health conditions. If you keep on living, there will come a day where ultimately God will call your name and you will join the ancestors. You'll join the great cloud of witnesses in the sky. Keep on living. There are certain matters that will be inevitable. And because of that, Solomon says, focus. Focus your attention because you know that there are certain matters that will come up in the course of this year that you'll need to pay attention to and be prepared for. Because of course, when the cloud gathers enough rain, it surely will fall. When the time is right, when the hour draws to its appropriate time, whatever it is in the course of this year, it's gonna happen. It's inevitable. And the word of wisdom for us today is to focus on these inevitabilities. First of all, so we're not caught off guard. Secondly, so that when they come, we are prepared for it. I'm reminded of this same Solomon who in Proverbs tells us to pay attention to the ant. It is inevitable that the seasons will change and the ant will not be able to gather its food to sustain itself over the course of late fall and winter. But when the spring rolls back around, the ant will be able to go back out again. And in the summer, the ant will find itself busy gathering resources. It's inevitable. So just like that ant has to prepare for the inevitabilities of the scarcity of winter, so, friend, will you and I need to prepare for the inevitabilities that are coming in this year. And my suggestion to, to you is, on a practical level, take out your calendar and see what's coming. Look at your bills and see how they line up with your income. Determine when that vacation season is coming for you. Pay attention to these holidays and birthdays so you're not caught off guard and run yourself into debt trying to make somebody else happy. There are certain matters which are inevitable. Solomon says in order to meet the moment wisely, you ought to focus on those times. They're coming, he says. And when they come, they will be there for all to see. That's the next part of that verse. As tree falls to the north or to the south, wherever that tree falls, it's going to lay down right there. It's inevitable that the matters that we face in life will be right there for us to see. And they will act on one hand as a stumbling block. On the other hand, they'll act as a reminder that this was bound to happen. It could be a stumbling block, however, if the inevitable tree falling in our lives causes us to take our eyes off of the end goal because there's a tree laying down in the way. That tree is there because it had nowhere else to fall. 
And when the tree falls, it will lay down right there. The question becomes of us who are traveling along our own journeys. When we see the tree, will we be distracted because we see it in the way? Or will we be determined to make our way around, across, or over that tree? It's going to fall. It's inevitable. There will come obstacles in life. There will come other things that we can pay attention to in life. And because they are inevitable, wisdom demands that we note that they are coming, but that we know we can keep moving in spite of. That's right. The tree will fall. Here's also something else that's inevitable. If you pay too much attention to these distractions that come, then you will not sow. Uh, you, you know this well, perhaps as much as I do, that the wind is listless. It blows wherever it wants to blow. And there's not a whole lot we can do about the blowing wind. The best that we can do is take a measurement and discover which direction the wind is blowing in. But here's what I like about what Solomon has to offer to us, that in our observation of the wind, our task is not to pay attention to the fact that the wind is blowing in order that we might be distracted from advancing. In fact, if we keep on moving, that very wind can be wind at our back. And still, if the wind is in your face acting for us as something to work through, even there, Solomon says, suggests to us that we ought not stop because the wind is blowing in our face. These contrary winds of life, the rough times, the hard times, when things aren't going our way, when we can't make sense of the world. Solomon says, if you stop long enough and you pay too much attention to that, you will not sow. But instead, focus demands that because the wind has a way of changing, that we note that the wind does blow, but that we know we can keep moving in spite of. Perhaps you'll catch that tailwind and that'll be a blessing to you. That's one of God's good graces. Perhaps you'll find a headwind and that'll be a blessing to you because it'll make you stronger. But whatever you do, don't stop sowing. The blessing of all of this is that harvest time will come. That's right. That's the other inevitability here. Harvest time will come. The question becomes... Have you been sowing even in the face of the wind? Keep on sowing. Keep on advancing. Make sure that as you focus, you focus on that which is redeemable and that you focus because of the inevitabilities of life. But then also on a final note, Solomon says focus is necessary because there are things that are unknowable. Unknowable. If you can continue to read along with me in verses five and six of this text. You do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. Just like you don't know these things, neither do we know which way God is going to work things out. That's right. God will work things out. But friends, we are not always privy to all the details. That's what Solomon is saying here. But just because we don't know the details doesn't mean we, we ought to lose our focus. In fact, because we don't know the details, our focus ought to increase that much more. Focus because of that which is unknowable. Uh, it's okay not to know all of what lies ahead. It's okay not to have full and complete information. Here's where you can start and perhaps here's where you can keep going. It is our trust in the God who knows it all and who's making it all come about. This is what Solomon points to at the end of verse five. It is God who makes everything. And so we may not know it, but we know who. We may not know how, but thank God we know who. We might not know from where, but we do know what we do know where we can look. We ought to lift our heads, our eyes to the hills, 
from whence cometh our help. And if the question is ever asked, I pray you already know this, but here it is if you don't. Our help comes from the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. God makes everything. And even if it is unknowable to us, it is not unknowable to God. That's why we ought to keep our focus. Focus because even if we don't know it all, God does. Even if we don't have all the answers, God does. Even if we don't know how we're going to maintain our strength, we can trust that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Even if we don't know the right words to say or how to keep moving, God's word is a light, un, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We may not know, but we ought to focus because God knows. And then finally, Solomon says in verse six, in the morning, sow your seed in the evening. Do not withhold your hand. It's something else here that's unknowable. You do not know which one will prosper, whether it's going to be your sowing or it's going to be not your reaping, but your giving away. We don't know which one will prosper. And I know we want to make sure that we sow our seed in good ground. And so we till the earth of the soil in our life experiences. And all along the way, we want to we want to make sure that we do all that we can to create conditions for success. Praise God for success. We all want to succeed in life. But can I tell you something? It, it's inevitable <laughs> that sometimes our best plans will come to waste. They'll come to naught. Because as the poet Burns and the novelist Steinbeck suggest, the very plans of mice and men have a way of falling apart. But thanks be unto God, even if we do not know, the blessing of this particular wisdom is that whether you are sowing in preparation for your own reaping or whether you are letting your hand free in order to give, it's going to prosper. Which one will prosper? which it will prosper in our lives. Is it going to be our sowing or is it going to be our giving? Friends, focus. Focus. That's the response to that question. Are, are we working toward that which is redeemable? Are we working because of the inevitabilities of life? And are we working because there are certain things that are unknowable in life? focus. No, we don't have to have all the answers up front. But we can take one step and then take another step and then ultimately we'll run into the providence of God. We'll meet the God who knows it all. We'll meet the God who has made it all. And we will meet the God who is the creator of us all. If we focus. So what has your attention? What has your attention? I want to suggest to you today that you set your mind, that you set your affections on things above. That, that Jesus Christ is the ultimate end and the aim of all of our plans. That God be glorified. Yes, in our investments. Yes, in our educational pursuit. Yes, even in the uh, cleaning up and decluttering of our homes in our work lives, when we go out to play, as we go out to dine and eat and fellowship, as we go out to enjoy the best of all that God has created for us, focus, knowing that even in this life, one thing we can count on is that there are uncertainties associated with this very life. But thanks be unto God who has given us Jesus, for it is in him that we live, that we move, and that we have our being. Praise God today, church. I want to extend this invitation to Christian discipleship. Perhaps you have received this message today and you've been thinking about joining the church. You've been thinking about being saved and being baptized, but you just, you know, you're not sure of, of certain things. How are they going to receive me? What will my life look like later? 
What's going to happen to me after I, after I get saved? Uh, if you receive this message today, then you'll know already what my response is going to be. Focus. Focus. Here's what you should be focusing on. The God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you live into that reality, my friend, my brother, my sister, you'll be able to enjoy all that God has promised to those who have received Christ Jesus for themselves. Receive Jesus today. There are two ways that we want you to do this. First, if you will go to our website, wordforlifechurch.org, you'll see the new members form there. Uh, fill in the information, hit submit, and we'll be in touch with you right away. You can also send us an email. Email us at newmembers at wordforlifechurch.org. Make sure we have your name and contact information, and we'll follow up with you as soon as we possibly can. And we share with you the next step along the path of your spiritual journey as a member and a brother and sister in Christ here at Word for Life Church Ministries. We invite those who are unsaved to receive this invitation. We also invite those of you who are saved already, but you do not have a church home and you've been wandering about and waiting for someone to invite you to come close. Well, here's the invitation. It's just for you. Yes, receive Jesus, but also, friend, receive this invitation to fellowship. I would love to serve you as your pastor. And there are brothers and sisters here at Word for Life Church who would love to walk alongside of you to experience life, to watch how God will move in your life, and to see how you might bless the people of God and our community. The invitation is extended to you as well. The same two ways, we want to invite you to go to our website, wordforlifechurch.org, and fill in that new members form. Or email us at, word for, at newmembers at wordforlifechurch.org. Thank you for that. Thank you for receiving the word today as a part of our worship experience. We're going to turn it over to our worship arts ministry. We're going to lead us in a short uh, hymn of praise. And then I want to invite you to join us at the Lord's table where we together will remember the sacrifice of our Christ in the Lord's Supper. God bless you. I'll see you soon.
recognize, God, how we love you and we thank you. We thank you, God, for all that you have done for us in ways that we can name and those, God, that we are even yet now unaware. Most of all, God, in this moment, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you, God, that you allowed him to die, that he might be the propitiation, the payment for our sins, that by his blood we have the redemption from our sins. In him we have life and we have it more abundantly. Thank you for Jesus. As we gather now, God, we pause to first of all reflect and remember on what it is that calls us to be here in the first place. And in that, God, we pray that you will forgive us for our sins. Forgive us, Lord, that we've been disobedient at times and we've gone contrary to your way and to your will. At the same time, God, we pray for grace that we will be able, God, to live up and into the holiness and the righteousness that we find in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We remember the nails. We remember the stake. We remember that cross. We remember his shed blood. And as we do so, God, we also know that in him we have salvation. Thank you for Jesus. We pray now, God, that you would consecrate these elements that we are yet to receive. And let it be for us, Lord, spiritually awakening, liberating, and wealth that we might prosper even as our soul prospers. May it be said, God, that as we leave and depart from this table, that we'll become better because we've been here at your invitation. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give you thanks. Amen. For I deliver unto you that which I also have received, that on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples. There he shared with them what must come, but the hours that would follow, yes, even over the course of the next three days. He gathered around that table at the supper. He took the bread. The Bible says that he blessed it and then he broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat all of it. In the same fashion, after the supper had ended, he took the cup, poured it out, blessed it, having said to his disciples, this is is the blood of the new covenant and it is poured out for all who will believe as often as we do this we do it in remembrance of him as disciples of the lord jesus christ let us now commune together Bible declares as often as we do this we show forth the Lord's death until he come until that day may we go forth as the disciples did in that day go forth rejoicing go forth singing go forth remembering what good things the Lord has done for us the promises of God on our lives determined this year to focus to focus on that which God has prepared and that by grace we may attain in his name. Glory be unto God. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Go in peace. May the peace of God go with you. Amen.